In the saddle up the creek with no paddle, no aliens to battle where we want to go. Without being pompous, we don't need map or compass. We're launching Caddy Wampus on our new travel show. Space Crew Tom, only go with us. Space Crew Tom, on our podcast bus. Space Crew Tom, we see your red nuts. And in space, no one can hear you scream. Loopy from our earworm, space shanty theme. Greetings, audience. It's me, Curdy Clamorwood. Sally and I are so glad to have you with us for another episode of Space Croutons 2.0. Today, we have a special treat for you from our very good friend, middle school technology guru and budding radio engineer, Seaver. I don't want to tell you too much, as Seaver has sent us a very interesting account of his recent and not-so-recent travels and experiences that occurred when his family moved into a new home. Cordy, remember that for Seaver's safety and well-being, we are not revealing his family's new location. You are so right, Sally. Thanks for the reminder. My dad used to say, If your head wasn't screwed on, you'd have to carry it around in a bucket. And if your head's in the bucket, where would I ice my beer? Nevertheless, I'm sure that all of our listeners will be intrigued and astounded by what Seaver has to share with us today. But before we play his story, let's take time out for a word from one of our sponsors, Grande Farm. When you portal jump or time travel, do you experience cold sweats, dizziness, unwarranted fatigue, irritability, loss of focus, even upset stomach, diarrhea, or nausea? If so, if so no, no need, need to worry! To worry. To worry. <laughs> It simply means your brain cannot process all of the conflicting messages your body is sending it due to traveling through time and traveling interdimensionally. Here at Grande Pharma, we have developed a simple remedy that relieves your time travel sickness symptoms. Just purchase our Bon Voyage patch and apply it 24 hours prior to your scheduled departure. You will arrive at your selected destination without any of the ill effects of time travel sickness thanks to Bon Voyage by Grande Pharma. Conveniently available at all portal shops, interdimensional hub stores, roundabout bodegas, and countless local groceries and druggists. Better Better living living with Grande Grande Pharma. Pharma. In clinical trials, less than 3% of users experience temporary loss of hearing, unlimited peripheral vision, loss of bowel control, and vomiting. Please alert your healthcare provider if you experience long-lasting memory issues. Do not use if you are pregnant, planning a pregnancy within three months of use, or are breastfeeding. Do not operate heavy equipment within 72 hours of use of the product. Do not take it if you have Parkinson's disease, Hansen's disease, or you can actually understand what I just said. And we're back and ready for today's story. Seaver sent us a voice recording detailing what he discovered at his family's new home, or should I say, on the family property. Now, let's hear from Seaver. Curdy, I stumbled across something really cool on our property. At first, I didn't know what to make of it, but now I think it's awesome. I have my friend Fairwin to help me tell the story. She was there for a large portion of it. I thought it might make the storytelling easier if she helped me out. Thanks for agreeing to help me, fair one. I'm totally cool with that, Seaver. You're welcome. Why don't you start off by telling the beginning? I wasn't there, and you can tell it better than I ever could. I guess the best way to start is at the beginning. That's the usual method. Stop interrupting. Anyways, Mom and Dad were encouraging me to get outside more. Maybe do some yard work or something. Our house is on 45 acres and most of it, other than the yard area around my house, is covered in dense woods, the tangled vines, and an amazing gully, but no other kids my age to hang out with for miles around. I was getting stir crazy in my room anyways, so I told them I would be happy to hang out in the woods behind the house. (laughs) 
It is like a temperate rainforest back there with the tallest trees I've ever seen. Thickets of brambles and those thick thorny vines. The quiet of the woods is undisturbed once you walk into the forest a few feet. You already feel as if you're traveling back in time because you don't hear any man-made sounds. There are no air conditioners humming, no car or truck noises, no airplanes flying overhead. You're giving me goosebumps with your description, but everything you just said is true. It's a little creepy walking into the woods behind your house. I don't think I would ever do it all by myself. To give you some context, this was the Saturday before Halloween, but I did not get freaked out about anything until I had been walking through the woods for about 15 minutes. That's when I came upon an opening in the woods. In this small cleared out area, I found a sturdily built block house with a heavy metal door in the middle of the south facing wall. Rectangular windows ran along the building near the roof line. I could see that a power line was feeding into the building. I tried to open the door. Unfortunately, it was locked. I looked around the area near the doorway, hoping to find a fake rock hide a key thingamajig, and noticed that an eight inch circular cement cover laying on the ground a few feet from the door. I lifted up the cover and found a hollowed out depression with a water shutoff valve and a water spigot and a key. I figured that I had nothing to lose, so I picked up the key and tried it in the door. It fit, and I was able to unlock the door and go inside. Don't stop there. Tell them what you saw inside. I wasn't stopping. Just taking a breath. Jeez, fair one. Would you calm down? Sorry. I'm just on pins and needles because I know what you found, and I can't wait for you to finish telling this part so I can tell about my discovery. You're on pins and needles. That must hurt. Okay, where was I? Right, coming inside the building. I had to pause on the doorstep a minute or two so my eyes can adjust. Even though there are windows around the top of the room, they aren't very large and don't allow a lot of light to come inside, especially in the late afternoon on an overcast cloudy day. Once I could see inside, I looked along the wall to my right. There was a dusty green camp cot with a folded wool army blanket on one end. The eastern wall of the building was covered in a black chalkboard with markings on the board, chalk on the chalk tray, and a black felt eraser lying next to the chalk. Directly in front of me was a massive table with only one metal chair. Along the wall was a variety of tubes, electrical components, and a microphone. It all looked like it was from Army-Navy surplus store after the Korean War, except for the electronics, which looked more like they came from the 1960s. The microphone especially dated the electronics as it was shaped around like a huge cylinder with rounded ends. The western wall of the building had a wooden structure in the corner with a standard interior door flanked by a hot water heater. A portal electric heater was plugged into the wall next to it. Directly to my left, I found a metal two-door cabinet over a square countertop with the boomerang laminate on it. I didn't see any creepy crawly things inside of the room, but I thought it was better to see what was behind the other door. I bet you were scared to open that door. I know I would have been. There could have been a dead body in there, a skeleton, or maybe even a zombie. I wasn't alarmed at the time. Everything looked fairly normal, other than the outdated electronic equipment. I didn't see anything to make me feel uneasy. The worst part of it was that the wind outside caused the exterior door to slam shut about the time I had reached to turn the knob inside the door. I have to admit, I did jump a little bit when that happened. Behind the door, there wasn't a dead body or a skeleton and no zombies either. It was just a shower sink and a toilet. I was pretty stoked. All I needed was to check and see if the electricity was working and I would have the coolest shack ever. Mom and Dad would probably even let me spend the night out here once in a while. I was making plans in my mind to add a mini fridge with some soft drinks in it as soon as I could save up some money for some. A pillow and a sheet for the camp cot would make me all set. I tried the light switch in the bathroom and the fixture came on with a dull yellowish glow. I mentally added, buy some light bulbs to my list of needs. Are you purposefully dragging the story out? Get to the good part. I want to tell Curdy about what I found in the room, and you haven't even got to the part where I come in yet. Calm down. I gotta tell this in my own way. After turning off the light in the bathroom area, I went back down to the main room and opened the cabinet doors. Inside, it was stocked with all my favorite treats, my favorite brand of chips, candies, snack cakes, and even soft drinks. I knew what this meant. I'd already traveled here at some point in the past. I let out a whoop of excitement, yes! closed and relocked the door, and sprinted as fast as I could back to the house. Once there, I dragged my parents back out there to check out what I hoped would become my shack. We had to bring flashlights with us, since the time was getting very close to dark. The next day, Fairwind's family came over for a visit and to trick-or-treat with my family. 
So I decided to take her out to see my amazing shack. Finally, now can I tell about what I discovered? Go ahead. When Zebra showed me the building, I was pretty excited, but I think the shack is a horrible name for it. If you fixed it up a little, it would be amazing. I immediately realized the electronic equipment in the building was basically a shortwave radio system setup. You see, my granddad has one at his house, and he lets me use it whenever we go to visit him. After spending nearly a month with him over the summer, he says I could run the whole station by myself if I had to do it. I showed Saver how to turn on the set, but unfortunately the components were so old that a couple of the tubes blew as soon as we turned the power on to it. We decided to look around to see if there were any components being stored in the building because my granddad always keeps extra parts for his station. That's when Fairwind made a brilliant discovery of a trunk underneath a camp cot. Let me tell this part. Tucked against the wall, underneath the cot was a metal footlocker. We tried to open it, but it was locked. We searched the cabinet, but didn't find a key in there. Seaver got a little frustrated and kicked the foot locker, and that did the trick. The lock popped open. It didn't do anything good to my toe. I felt like it broke it. Inside the trunk, we found a very fascinating book. I guess you could call it a journal. As we read the first few pages, we soon discovered that the journal belonged to a man who had lived in the same house that Seaver's family is living in now. Only he lived in the house during the early 1960s. I was fascinated by his story. I started reading it out loud as Seaver looked through the other items in the footlocker. I had to stop her when she mentioned the word Kordak. I couldn't believe that we had a journal from the 1960s and that it had mentioned the Kordax. This guy was already trying to find the Kordax. He built a shortwave radio with some interesting modifications that would allow him to use the set and pinpoint locations for the Kordax, not just use the physical locations, but also their locations through time. This guy was so far ahead of his time, technologically speaking. People probably thought he was nuts. We glanced through the rest of the journal and saw that his last entry was from November 27th, 1965. In it, the writer revealed that he was going to collect the Kordax he had located using his radio set. He comments that he is turning off the radio set when he leaves. Hearing that date, I immediately put two and two together. I said, oh my gosh, Seaver, do you know what happened on November 27th, 1965? I was kind of sarcastic with her. Let me think. It was a Saturday. London B. Johnson was president of the U.S. at that time. France had launched their first satellite into space, becoming the third nation in space. Oh, and there was a large march in Washington, D.C. protesting the Vietnam War. Also, my grandpa Jake would have turned four years old on that day. I can't think of anything else. You goofball. No, none of those things are what I am talking about. November the 27th is the day that the burning lady signal went silent. This radio station could have been the one broadcasting the burning lady signal. The modifications that the writer of the journal made to the shortwave set could explain the odd noises that were associated with the burning lady. I bet you a million dollars I'm right about that. I had no idea what she was talking about. I had never heard of the burning lady signal. My granddad told me about it. Maybe you've heard of the buzzer or the Lincolnshire poacher. These are radio stations that broadcast strange sounds all the time. Some people think that these signals are a way for spies to receive messages. The burning lady signal was only active for a few years in the early 1960s, and it stopped broadcasting at 1127 on November 27th. If we could get this shortwave set to work again, we could prove my theory. I wanted to know where we were going to find the part for this thing. Even if we could find an open radio shack today, there's no way it would carry this old tech. That's when I reminded Seaver that time travel is now an everyday thing. You know you already went back in time. Just look at the contents of that cabinet and tell me you did not stock that thing back in 65. All Seaver had to do is hit a portal and go back to November 28, 1965. Radio Shack was pretty much everywhere back then. My granddad got all his stuff from there and he lives in a small town. I was sure that Seaver could go and find what we needed. However, things did not go quite as we had planned. I didn't even have any trouble traveling back to 1965 and finding a Radio Shack with all the parts we needed was not the hard part either. I found the trunk underneath the cot just as Fairwin had seen it on the day before, or almost 51 years later depending on how you look at it. The difficulty lay in the backwater area I traveled to. The people there were pretty much united in their opinion that time travel is an impossibility and had banned anything related to time travel. There were a bunch of time travel deniers. There were no magic roundabouts, no interdimensional hubs, no time travel services of any kind in that area. I kind of got stuck back in 1965 for several months. I had to get an after-school job to raise enough money to buy a bus ticket to an area where time travel was allowed. 
Fortunately, I had the shack to shelter me, and no one hassled me about school attendance since I only worked after school hours and on weekends. I just had to stay out of sight during the school day, and all the adults thought I was in school. To occupy my time during the day, I decided to make a graphic novel including lots of season one space crew on adventures. I wish I still had it, but I accidentally left it at my part-time job. Did you sign your artwork in the graphic novel? No, not my real name. I used a anagram of my name. Let me guess. You signed it revise? That's right. How did you know that? It's just the most famous graphic novel in all of North America. It was the first one ever published, and it came out in early 1966. Other graphic novels came out in the mid-70s, but only yours in the 60s. People always wondered why the artist revised never did any more. If you tried to do more now, I'm not sure how it would be received. Would people say you were just copying the style of revised and trying to co-opt his fame? Hey, I'm famous. Yep, but only you and I know about it. How about an autograph? That is all of the digital recording Seaver shared with us. Thank you, Sally, for your able AI assistance. And thanks to Seaver and his friend Fairwin for sharing this story. Sounds like a great adventure. Personally, I would like to know more details of his time in 1965. I'm sure that was quite a challenge to a young person of today to get along without so many of the things that are commonplace now. Imagine it. Sieber had to live without streaming movies, online searches, and Minecraft. <laughs> well, I think we should talk with Sieber further to see if there are any clues as to the identity of the man who left the journal. I'd really like to know more about him. And as we close, friends, remember that chocolate is better when you don't keep it in your pocket. And as always, keep peace in your hearts until our next story time. So when we leave the station For each time or space Vacation If you do, well, you can kiss it. Space Croutons, Season 2.0. Space Croutons brings new worlds to know. Space Croutons, subatomic and your flow. As we cruise the Milky Way by Tractor B. And the Cordax are just a distant dream. And our brains have turned to sour cream. Look me from our earworms, space shanty feet. Space Croutons. Space Croutons is a work of original fiction. Similarities to persons, situations, or events, real or fictional, is coincidental and unintentional. Created and written by Jerry, Jace, John, Della, and Jeff Goodson. Episode story by Della. Original music by Jeff. Production by Della and Jeff. Featuring the voice talents of Levi Blakesley, Marianne Ripsom, Jeff, and Sally. Entire work copyright 2021 by Jeff, John, Jerry, Della, and Jace Goodson. This has been a Good Witch Audio Production.